Hello, I'm Alex Dickens from Team 2654 e Echo, and this is going to be the start of our Programming for Vex Robotics Explainer series. So what are these videos going to be? I'm going to explain my approach to programming competitive robotics, specifically Vex Robotics, and I aim to help students with their approach to programming competitive robotics in the future. Starting off, video zero, Introduction to Competitive Robotics Programming. In this video, I will go over my input-output ideology, my moving target theory briefly, some tips and tricks, and how to find useful resources. So going into the ideology, inputs and outputs. You have inputs that feed in all the data that you take into your robot code and you have to make outputs. That's how I always think about how I program for my robot. Taking these inputs and changing them in the code, maybe doing path following, any of those things, those are all ways that you take those inputs and convert them into useful outputs or like the motor movements or the solenoid actuations. And that's the real goal of competitive robotics. An example is for mechanism drives. So you have the inputs such as the drivetrain movement idea where you have the stick pointed to the top right on the left and the right on the right and what that what you're asking it to do is to move in that way and turn that way as you can see in the bottom right image this is done with four independently actuated wheels right so you have to figure out how you're going to make those outputs useful and like follow what you want it to do so i always break down the problem so the rotation aspect all you have to do is move the left side forwards and the right side backwards to rotate the robot right to, to do that, it's relatively simple, and it can be flipped easily for the desired rotation. You really don't have to go too far into that. It's just proportional times the amount that the right stick has moved. Next, you have the translation aspect. Moving forward is fairly simple as well. It's just like a tank drive. You move all the wheels forwards, it moves forwards, and that's super easy. And then the last part is moving sideways. This is way more difficult than either of the other two, but really, if you break it down and you look at it, say, how do the wheels move when I want it to move this way? You can say, oh, all the mo wheels move this way. But how do you put this all together? Well, if you just add all the individual inputs and you can get some output. So you find that you go through the sequence of inputs to split to Cartesian, the X and Y components of the joysticks, and then you find the individual motor components for each of the Cartesian inputs, and then you add them all together and you get the final output. That's how I think about it in the mechanism case. Um, and then overall, how you can see this is, is user inputs, such as the joystick inputs, they all go into that robot code that I actually just described there, and they create these useful outputs. So I think about all my code in that exact same way. Next, moving target theory. This theory goes on the idea that getting code right has to have enough correct tuning numbers. So this can be positions for stuff, distances you need to move, DID values, any of that stuff. But all of these numbers need to be exactly correct to actually have the robot do exactly what you want, because these things are finicky. But you have to think about it this way and say, well, what can we do to either make it easier to tune, have to tune it less, make the targets wider, or have the parameters not exist? So more dimensions is the um like where more variables are needed so let's say where you have seven different places where you have to hit within an inch versus one or two moving faster where you have battery or motor temperatures changing behavior or the batter or hardware degrading this is especially seen in dome matches over the past couple of years where teams are very very unreliable with their autonomous routines and then target can be smaller where you have like poor hardware or some other difficult to tune parameters which might have to be constantly fixed all the time and this is especially present in PID loops. You can see that, for example, let's say you have this turning PID, where you have to have both these values pretty much correct, or else the robot doesn't turn right, and all your stuff is inaccurate. So this gives programmers a couple ways to fix their stuff. You either reduce the number of variables they have to tune for your robots. This can be either hardware, software, maybe even a combined approach. Create tuning routines to ensure that code always acts the same. So this might be having a very set way to tune your PID loops so that your robot always acts the same, no matter when you tune it, where you tune it and then increase the number of variables that are automatically tuned. And this is something I'll have a whole video about later where they have system identification where the robot will basically figure out how it drives and tune those variables accordingly. Some tips and tricks that I always follow are videoing every single run, especially in skills where it's a whole minute, you can't really remember exactly what happened in every single part of the path. Having that entire video you can go back on and review and fix it is extraordinarily helpful and there's really no harm in doing this in my opinion it i mean maybe you don't get like you have to have someone videoing it but just delete the videos after and they're not useful and then additionally with many many videos you can find unfindable patterns 
previously. Let's say the robot was always one inch off on this exact space, but it varied just a little bit. Saying, looking at the last video, you could say, oh, it was two inches off this time, must be two inches off every time. But if you take a look at five different videos, you can see, oh, it was from zero to two inches off. So we probably should change it about one inch so that we have the average there. That's something that I do often. Another useful thing that I always do is utilize source control management. So I commit at least every practice, if not four or five, maybe even 10 times per practice. And I usually branch for all changes or practices. And I keep a working branch at all times. And I use branch protections for this to on my main branch. And I say, if I haven't tested it on the robot, I can't commit it to main. The main branch has to be working all the time, no matter what, even if it's not working quite as well as some branch theoretically would, I just have to have that main branch be the source of good code so that if something breaks and I somehow change it something gets lost even if i lose a whole laptop i can go to another one download all my code and get started within five minutes which is invaluable on the competitive robotics scene because who knows what will happen units uh, i always have a standard way to work with units i only utilize one set of units in my code everywhere but or sorry so having a standard way to work with units is extraordinarily important. I utilize a rich unit system, but you can either go with one of these two approaches, I'd say. Utilize either one set of standard units in your code. So establish this at the beginning, say I'm only using inches, degrees, and this. And then make sure that you name everything properly and only do translations where needed and stuff like that. And you just have a very specific way that you do it. This may keep code simpler in some ways, but it'll, you'll have a lot of translations that are unnecessary, where if you utilize a rich unit system, which I have a library for this, it makes it so you can basically say, well, lift, set your position to 180 degrees, and it just does it. You don't have to think about all the implementation details of 180 degrees, two radians, or one radian, or pi radians, stuff like that. You just have to say, I want it to go to this spot, and it does it, and you can put in any units that you want. And then the last thing, safety boring i know right but um seriously in robotics you have to consider this it's, i've gotten my fingers eaten by the robot while climbing especially this year the climbing can result in a bunch of robot damage when practicing so eliminating this in any way possible such as having a kill switch or stuff like that it's just extraordinarily important to say we have to think about this how can we eliminate robot damage how can we save time that way and just actually putting like 10 15 minutes of thought even it doesn't have to be extraordinarily long but just putting some thought into it i found is extraordinarily helpful for my programming next is finding resources vex is a smaller community but there's still some amazing resources especially the brls wiki there's some on youtube other than these videos and then discord servers such as lemlib and vex teams of the world are a great places to find code help and i'll link servers and all, the brls wiki in the description Another great place to find resources is any FTC at FRC resource. I always think the WPI lib coded and documentation is absolutely incredible. So take a look at that. Even if you're not going to use all of it, just taking a look at what someone else does is really good. And then FRC teams often release their code from past years. So just take a look at those teams, see what they do. I find that has been very important for my development as a programmer. And then for papers, uh, I would look at research papers from industry and you can find approaches for example, I found Monte Carlo localization this year, which allows for higher localization compared to the post tracking approaches introduced by like the pylons. And it, that allowed me to be a lot more competitive in skills this year. Um, and then quickly, some future topics. In this series, I'm going to talk about Monte Carlo localization as the first video. It's a little more complex, but I think it's pretty cool. Path planner explanation video. I'm going to go over some motion profiling in Remsetti, then calibration and command scheduler. But if you have anything else you want to see, just make sure to put it in the comments. I'll take a look at it. And I'm more than open to do a whole bunch of videos about stuff. Okay, thanks for watching.